Welcome all. I'm Salvatore Scalzo from the European Commission, and I have today the pleasure to moderate uh, an extremely qualified panel on one of the crucial topics related to the AI Act, standardization. And you have seen also today in the morning during the political panel, the standardization was mentioned by several panelists. Let me first provide you before starting uh, with a short introduction on the contents and the background of the panel. The proposed AI Act, as, as you may know, is structured in the form of the so-called NLF, New Legislative Framework Legislation. What is NLF? NLF is a well-experimented regulatory scheme which has been used by the EU legislators since the 80s to regulate products within the EU. And it has successfully contributed to the establishment of a strong internal market within the EU for safe and compliant products. Just think of medical devices, machinery, radio equipment, products that we use every day are regulated according to this regulatory technique. And what is the main feature of the new legislative framework technique? In fact, within each NLF legislation, the legal act lays down the requirements that products are expected to comply with before being placed on the market, but does not lay down the detailed technical solution that must be used by the operators. In fact, harmonized standards, which are produced by European standardization organization are exactly meant to do that. That is to say, to lay down more operational concrete technical solutions that help operators to comply with the requirements, the high level requirements set in the legislation. You can easily see from these considerations that uh, the topic of harmonized standards is a key topic for the successful implementation of the future AI Act, as harmonized standards will in fact operationalize the requirements of the AI Act into concrete technical solutions that operators uh, will apply in order to be compliant. Today, the objective of this panel is to facilitate a discussion with uh, relevant stakeholders about standardization. And I'm very grateful to all the panelists, which as you can see also come from different and represent different parties in the standardization system. We will talk about the state of play of international and European standardization work on artificial intelligence. We will explore the specific challenges and needs linked to the AI Act, but also try to identify the specific role of each stakeholder in the future standardization system. And now before starting, I would like to introduce very briefly all our panelists. You can have already a good overview, I think in the slide that is currently visible to everyone. We have, first of all, two experts from the standardization world. So Sebastian Hallensleben, who is head of digitalization at BDE, one of the largest engineering associations, and now chairs the Joint Technical Committee on Artificial Intelligence within Sense and Elec, which is one of the European standardization organizations. The second speaker, Lindsay Frost, who is the chief standardization engineer at NEC Laboratories Europe, he is also the chair of the ETSI OCG AI Group and external advisor to the standict.eu 2023 Observatory on Standardization. Then our third speaker will bring in uh, a, more, a very important research perspective on AI standardization. In fact, Carlos Torresilla Salinas is the head of the Digital Economy Unit in the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. And, the, and this unit has already carried out very important work on AI standardization that you will certainly briefly present. Then uh, we have two experts from the side of the markets and operators actually, so from the operator side, we have in fact invited Lara Visser and Sebastiano Toffaletti. Lara Visser is a policy director at Digital Europe, which is the leading trade association representing digital transforming industries in Europe. Mr. Toffaletti, on the other hand, is the head of the Brussels Secretariat of the European Digital SME Alliance, which is the Europe's largest association for digital small and medium-sized enterprises. Last but not least, we have Leticia Cayeto, which brings certainly an important analytical and business perspective as she's the managing director at Accenture, where she leads Accenture's data and AI business in Europe and the conversation, conversational AI domain globally. We are ready to start. I think the path is set for an exciting and very informative session. Just to remind that we will have with our 
distinguished speakers a first round of questions. So we will go straight into question without any introductory statement. And then the second part of the discussion will try, of course, to engage our speakers further, but also on the basis of the questions that we will receive. And for that reason, I really encourage all of you to post your questions in Slido. You may be able to see the QR code, which allows you to access the relevant Slido platform. So on that basis, we can make the, and we can engage the audience in steering the discussion. And now we can officially start. We start with Sebastian Hallensleben, chair of the Joint Technical Committee of Sense and Elec on Artificial Intelligence, with some general but also very precise questions. Uh, first of all, do you think that harmonized standards, Sebastian, are the right choice for the implementation of a framework on artificial intelligence? And how do you see the challenges related to that and to creating harmonized standards? Notably, can standards be elaborated on time? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Thank you for uh, the invitation to the panel and to this event. Um, the short answer to your question, are harmonized standards the right tool, is yes. Um, and I'd like to elaborate a little bit. Um, first of all, um, you've already mentioned that standardization and regulation go hand in hand. And this has been formalized uh, for many decades at the European level. But what is actually the difference between the two? Um, on the regulation side, we, we know that there are um, democratic processes, there are structures, uh, there, there, there are voting mechanisms. Uh, that many people are familiar with, but on the standardization side, um, the mechanisms are, are less obvious or maybe less well known. Um, so the important point there is that standardization is fundamentally consensus building. So standardization is a set of processes and a set of structures to reach consensus, and that can be a long and painstaking process. And the um, key point here is that uh, the stakeholders that come together to forge a consensus are not just whoever likes to be involved, but actually um, are all the relevant stakeholders. And this is, this is an ex explicit instruction to the uh, European standardization organizations to bring together all relevant stakeholders. So that includes, um, of course, um, uh, companies um, that have an interest in interoperability of systems, um, but it also includes um, the so-called NX3 organizations, so uh, consumers, um, environmental concerns, uh, employees, um, as well as small businesses. And um, standardization means, European standardization means that a consensus is reached between all these relevant stakeholders. So what, we, what emerges in the standardization world has a different kind of uh, genesis uh, compared to uh, regulation, but it also has a fairly strong uh, legitimacy. And it tries to um, make sure that, that the expertise that is necessary to define technical details to underpin regulation are actually brought into the um, discussion. And uh, we are in the fortunate position that the NLF and the tool of harmonized standard, uh, standards in, in fact uh, defines how that synergy uh, exactly works and how those kind of two sources of um, legitimacy are brought together. Now, the, the big challenge is timing. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, standardization is a long and arduous process. Um, interests diverge quite a lot, so it's not easy to forge consensus. Um, but at the same time, AI is a fairly dynamic issue and uh, we can't wait for, for many, many years to put uh, regulation into, into force, uh, uh, just waiting for standards to be ready. So in that context, the, the important tools are the uh, standardization requests that the European Commission can issue to European standardization organizations in order to specify a need, formally specify a need, but also to provide additional resources that might not be uh, available within uh, the ESOs and the expert networks themselves. So I hope that's that's an initial quick quick sweep of the of the answer space. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sebastian. No, it is an extremely good start, and I think you raised also many important topics in terms of, for example, technical expertise, uh, engagement of stakeholders, which uh, will come back, I guess, later also in the other 
interventions uh, and uh, any and also you highlighted also the challenges linked to this exercise and when we come to challenges i, I move now to Lindsay frost uh, of course we want to see also what is already out there and how the standardization organizations are moving towards making this effort so my questions to Lindsay, who is active in the other important uh, european standardization organization etsy is uh, what is the state of play uh, of AI standardization. Lindsay, we know that you are an uh, advisor also to the Stand ICT laboratory and project, which has actually already worked on a, a, kind, uh, on a high level mapping of AI standardization. And how do you think that different European and international standardization organizations are and should be collaborating in the future to reach, uh, let's say, to achieve the outcomes we all wish? Thanks. Okay, thank you. Let me first. Uh... So I, I second everything that uh, Sebastian just said from a Sensenlink point of view, and the consensus building is the the key, but also the the, the extreme difficulty because, uh, as people say, AI is now everywhere. It's it's a very young uh, technology in the sense of being or having become practical, but it's already, as people say, in toys, in medicine, in recommendation systems for insurance it's it's affecting people's lives so um the trouble is that um you know everything becomes called ai there are so many techniques out there that uh whatever standards body you go to you'll find um somebody there or some group talking about ai so in a way it's early days but on the other hand uh, all of the eight of the stos the standards bodies are doing something and uh what the uh, European Commission has put on the table as draft legislation is uh, going really uh, three jumps ahead and saying, uh, how do we try to standardize these different ways of using AI? And indeed, uh, how do we uh, detect uh, or define when not to use them? And this work in the standardization world is really in not even in, in the baby shoes. It's, it's, a, it's a really tough job, which is just starting. And in this um, European project uh, funded by the Commission to look at the, the global resources on, on standards, uh, the stand ICT uh, work, we, we pulled together about, um, about a dozen experts from many different groups. And I think we found in the end about 300 different standards uh, related or standards uh, documents from IEEE, from ITUT, uh, from ISO IC, SENSENLEC, ETSI, and uh, we tried to see what is the, uh, the different topics which were covered and in particular uh, some ideas about maturity and the work that uh, you Salvatore in, in the commission in the AI watch group did uh, went into even more detail about that. I hope that this, uh, this uh, workshop will provide links to some of these uh, resources, but in the end, um, I have to say that I work in an industry research lab. That's my my employer is NEC, and my colleagues in the lab are talking about explainability. And when I ask them about standardizing their work, they well they laugh at me. That's they're they're uh, they're uh, five years ahead. So and standards is much too slow. So um, everybody says standards is much too slow, but in fact um, this collaboration process is a huge job, and. Uh, when we looked at uh, all the groups who I, I mentioned briefly, so ISO, IC, Sense, and like Etsy, and so on, um, what everybody does uh, is uh, you get the members together, you discuss what they want to uh, cover in AI, you clarify what definitions, what problems to look up, divide up the work, create some draft documents which are not too embarrassing, and then you go away and um, liaise them to other groups, and it's like throwing a stone into a lake, you get ripples, and then uh, other people start throwing stones, uh, so verbally or uh, fictionally, and you end up with a big discussion group about trying to uh, align the language, um, define what are the crucial problems, and that's the stage where we are now. So that means that the Commission and the legislators in, in Europe and globally actually have a big problem, uh, how, to, how to reduce to a uh, a doable set of uh, tasks within a rather short time because the business and, and the consumers don't want to wait. So 
what we have now is that the standards bodies, all of us, have to identify what are the true um, risk areas where the AI legislation uh, needs to, 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 to grasp and to, to, to be applied. What kind of real threats or can be criminal, can be accidental, are um, you know, impacting the, the solutions that come to the market? And how can we test and, and define in advance if, if those solutions are um, complying as well as possible to the legislation? And that is the problem too. There's no guarantee. So even if someone does a great job on all of the checks and balances, in the end, um, the AI systems are dynamic. And um, sometimes the amount of work to make it perfect is just out of all proportion to, to, to the actual application. And so I'd, I'd like to just summarize by saying, uh, it's like saying make electricity predictable and safe. Yes, we have since a hundred years, but uh, still you get electrical accidents and still you get whole power networks going down. Uh, but if we didn't try, then we'd be in, in much bigger trouble. So I think the SEOs are doing a good job the time is far too short. Um, we need to focus on, let me say, some example uh, problems and get them done in, in a good way where there's agreement. And then we can expand out. So the Commission's approach or the global approach to be risk-based is, is good. And um, the trouble is going to be to, uh, when this comes to the market and comes to legislation and comes to legal battles, because uh, lawyers really like uh, black on white and uh, with AI it's uh, well, I think you can show due diligence, but you cannot show that you've you've prevented every single risk. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Lindsay, for this. And I think also you introduced uh, also part of my questions so to Carlos Torresilla from uh, our joint research center. Uh, as I already mentioned, JRC made already some important work because there was a regular collaboration on the topic of artificial intelligence also with, uh, with DigiConnect uh, in the European Commission. And, uh, and the first mapping already towards the AI requirements was elaborated, the first high level analysis. So the first question is, uh, what is the first feeling of JRC following this work, Carlos? And the second question also from a research and scientific perspective, and as a result of this work, where do you see, Lindsay already anticipated something, where do you see the more challenging areas of the regulation for in the, the view of standardization? Thanks. Well, uh, first of all, thank you, Salvatore, for, for your question and for your kind uh, invitation to today's event. I'm very honored to be to be here with, uh, with this very nice panel. As you said, we have indeed uh, recently published a, a report in which what we are doing is we're trying to analyze the AI standards landscape, and we are trying to map this landscape to the requirements stemming from the AI Act. We think this uh, report comes quite timely and will contribute to the ongoing discussion uh, around the AI Act. But let me address first the, the, the first part of your, of your questions. What are our initial results? And the first conclusion that I would like to highlight is that we have actually found quite a significant number of AI standards. And these are good news because the work to operationalize the AI Act will not need to start from the scratch and can build upon existing uh, uh, results. The second conclusion that I think uh, is important to highlight is that we have been able to identify 12 uh, requirements, 12 uh, standards that we call essential standards, either in terms of operationalization, so readiness for implementation, or in terms of suitability, meaning that they fit for the purpose of the requirements stemming from the AI Act. And out of these 12 uh, uh, essential requirements, we have identified a group of six that we call core that are basically fit for both operationalization and uh, suitability. Uh, it's important uh, to know that our methodological approach has been based in the definition of uh, an operationalization indicator. This basically has allowed us, we have computed this using uh, a systematic uh, approach combining automatic and manual uh, uh, reviews, uh, has allowed us to recognize the gaps. And this is very important. What uh, uh, do I mean when I say uh, gaps? Well, I mean uh, those areas in which uh, to cover the requirements of the AI Act, significant standardization efforts are going to be needed. And we think this is uh, very relevant because uh, knowing those gaps uh, will allow us to focus those efforts to warranty that there is a, a full implementation of the AI gap, of the AI Act. 
So basically the message is that although there is already work done and we don't start from the scratch, there are still significant efforts to be, to be, to be done. Uh, and this uh, uh, leads me to the second part of your question. So uh, what are the challenges? For instance, there are some areas that we have uh, identified where gaps are relevant. Technical documentation is one of those. Data and data governance is, uh, is, is another one. For instance, uh, with regards to the requirements uh, for the technical documentation, we think that those uh, uh, pose uh, significant research and scientific challenges, maybe linked to the, to the level of detail of the related provisions in the, in the AI Act. There is another big challenge that also comes uh, uh, quite often when we discuss with European standardization uh, standard organizations, which is the, the, the topic of the test on AI. We know that uh, the classical approach uh, to test when coming to standards is based is based on measuring the physical uh, the physical uh, 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 components of the of the system. But in the case of AI, the approach is much more functional than, than, uh, than physical. And here, uh, the challenge is to come with a, a, a test framework that will jo join uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, procedures will allow us to verify the uh, functioning of the AI system. So how to come with a testing framework that needs to be defined with a different approach than the classical uh, 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 one used in standards. And the, the final challenge is has, it has to do a lot with the particular nature of the AI systems. So the complexity of uh, the large scale AI systems, the fact that AI is uh, a general purpose technology, uh, the difficulty of uh, trace back uh, uh, the, or explain the decisions that sometimes an AI system uh, takes, the difficulty of trace back to the initial requirements, the difficulty of predicting uh, how an AI system will behave in a real life uh, case. All of these concepts that I'm mentioning that are linked to properties like uh, explainability, uh, opacity, uh, transparency, uh, robustness, uh, cybersecurity are still pretty much open questions in the field of research. Uh, and we are trying to standardize these areas where still uh, there are many open questions. This means that standards will need to be defined with a very agile approach, thinking that most probably those standards will need to be iterated quite soon, as soon as uh, uh, knowledge is coming to answer those still open questions. So if uh, you allow me to summarize my, 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 my message, in the side of the results, the good news is that we are not starting from the scratch. There are already uh, a set of uh, standards that will allow us to uh, start uh, our work, but still significant work is to be done. And as uh, my, my, my previous fellow speakers have, have mentioned, in an open and engaged discussion with uh, the, all the different stakeholders from industry, uh, policy, etc. And in the side of the challenges, we're still speaking about research, ongoing research. So this means that standards will need to be defined on a very agile way so we can, uh, let's say, iterate as uh, we may need. And that's all from my side, Salvatore. Thanks a lot. Really, thanks, Carlos, also for having summarized and being so concrete and detailed in five minutes. I think uh, that is very enriching and also values very much the shows the work that GRC has already done uh, in this field, which is, uh, which is an important basis for future work. And uh, now we can move, uh, as I also said in the introduction, to really the market operator side. So also to gather what is the feeling from the market about how standardization could work in the future. So my question now is uh, to Lara Visser from Digital Europe. Uh, welcome, first of all. Uh, I had two questions uh, at this stage. One uh, linked to what I asked initially also to Sebastian. So how do you see in general uh, the validity and the adequateness of harmonized standards in making the system work for AI in the future. And second, also based on your experience with other sectors, what is in your view crucial, uh, already some elements have popped up in previous interventions, but what, what do you see as crucial uh, in, in a nutshell to make the standardization system work? Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much, Salvatore, and, and thank you indeed also for, for the invitation to be in this, uh, in this panel. Um, so I think when, when looking really at the at the AI Act uh, and, and really the requirements there, some being quite uh, vague, uh, subjective, complex, 
it is really important to have indeed the harmonized standards to, to facilitate uh, the implementation, compliance, and, and ultimately, of course, also the, uh, the actual enforcement. So building on our experience also on the NLF, which, as was already mentioned, uh, traditionally focused really on hardware products, where we have a lot of uh, experience, of course, also with our uh, sector, we see a really huge benefit of these uh, harmonized standards to, to create a harmonized and, uh, and single market, really facilitating um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the placing on the market of, uh, of products and now moving into um, also software and complex um, uh, technologies. Saying that, and it was also already mentioned uh, by the previous speakers, we are seeing uh, also some, some challenges. I mean, it's, it's quite different looking at some of the, uh, the standards that have been developed for, uh, for products, uh, looking now at, at some of the requirements. It, it will require a lot of uh, technical expertise as, as was already uh, mentioned. And in fact, it may also, and that's something we are also looking at as, as Digital Europe, some of the requirements in the AI Act now uh, may need to be perhaps uh, further clarified, um, simplified, um, et cetera, to, to make it uh, then easier to, uh, when the standardization requests are, are transmitted, uh, to facilitate the actual trans, uh, standardization uh, work. So that is something we're still very much looking into uh, as we speak, but um, we are already looking at the AI Act now to see what could potentially uh, be some challenges uh, challenges later on from the, in the standardization work um, on harmonized standards, uh, as was already mentioned, we we see it as as crucial to have this very inclusive uh, approach. Um, you know, bringing all relevant stakeholders together, and it was already uh, you know made a very explicit, like really bringing all stakeholders together and working towards uh, consensus on this. This is very important to, to make sure that it is also uh, you know, practical and can actually be, be implemented. Um, so we very much uh, support that, uh, that approach and also really a bottom-up approach rather than a more kind of top-down uh, uh, approach to, um, to, to the implementation of these kind of requirements. And a point which was already mentioned also by, um, by Lindsay actually, but I wanted to make that more specific also from really business perspective Perspective is that the, uh, the, the many of the, the developers, users of AI in Europe, they're not just operating in one country or even in the European market only. They're very often um, predominantly uh, international players, or at least they may have ambition to to put their uh, their products also on uh, on an international market. They want to scale, especially. And I can imagine maybe Sebastiano will go into more details, of course, with um, with SMEs uh, also. So ultimately, turning these standards also into international standards or building on some of the international standards already out there is is really important to. Um, yeah, to really help uh, business to scale and to uh, yeah to not have just a national or only European uh, approach. So for that, we would very much uh, welcome and, and support further collaboration uh, and participation also by European stakeholders into those international fora and obviously also uh, vice versa. So we see great opportunities also with you know enhanced EU US relations, for instance, looking at AI to uh, to bring this really also at the uh, at the international uh, level. So I, I will stop my uh, my intervention uh, here to leave also time uh, later on for further uh, further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Lara. And thanks uh, for introducing this first market perspective. I turn now to Sebastiano. Also welcome, Sebastiano. Uh, I mean, the topic on how the relationship between standards and SMEs is a controversial one, but certainly uh, we see a lot of opportunities also for SMEs in standardization. But what do you think uh, SMEs need to get access, apply proper standards, and what are the specific challenges for them in this field? Thanks, Sebastian. All right. Good afternoon, and thank you, Salvatore, for the good question. Um, let me let me try to elaborate a little bit what we think about that, because uh, indeed uh, the choice that is put forward by the Commission to use standardization to regulate a, a artificial intelligence is in principle a good one, right? Uh, but it comes with uh, uh, the need to address some fundamental issues, especially with regard to SMEs, and I have three main points to raise that I would like your attention to, 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 to bear with me. Uh, the first one, which is quite obvious, is the, that uh, the moment we, that uh, the, the regulator, you know, delegates standardization bodies to, to, to set, set the rules, 
essentially we we need then to make sure that there is an appropriate representation of smes in the standardization setting bodies uh, i'm not saying anything new here and no one can contest uh, uh, because it's a fact that smes are severely underrepresented in standardization making uh, the standardization organizations themselves uh, some of which still try to argue the opposite uh, uh, are unwilling to disclose any figure about the real participation of SMEs. And even when they do so, they fail to distinguish between the real SMEs and the consultants, which they count as SMEs, simply because they are professional people who develop standards, so experts. Um, and the AI, Act, uh, the AI Act, unfortunately, does not address this problem because it doesn't provide anything specific. And even worse, in the case of uh, there is Article 57, which establishes an expert an experts group, which you know about, uh, this article fails to provide any specific requirement for the participation of SMEs. So there is room for improvement there. The, so, the second issue that I want to bring forward is the following, and it is the cost of compliance. Because in the impact assessment uh, that the Commission uh, came, comes along with the Commission proposal, uh, the cost of compliance, uh, um, uh, the cost of conformity assessment is estimated in uh, something like between five and 7,000 euros. So this is the money that an SME has to pay to a third party certification body to perform their assessment, right? It may be more, maybe less in some cases, but okay, let's assume this is a correct figure. But what is really not correct here is that this is only the cost that you have to bear in order to be compliant uh, once you can go to the conformity assessment body. But before going to the conformity assessment body, an SME will have to pay someone, let's say a consultancy, to evaluate their product and advise them how to be compliant with the, the, the relevant standards. This is the first thing. And secondly, uh, an SME then will have to pay its own internal people, so it will have an internal cost to make sure they adapt the product to what the consultancy has advised. So some people, uh, you see, the cost is not going to be five to 7,000 euros, but it's going to be much higher. Some of our experts, they say they estimate even in the range of 100,000 euros per product. So it's a substantial issue and it becomes even worse if you think about uh, product versioning. So every time an SME developer releases a new update of the same product, if you follow the NLF, the new legislative principles that are in this, in this proposed legislation, uh, the conformity assessment body will have to issue a new certificate. And note here that in all the other sectors, uh, not AI, okay, not ICT, all the other sectors that have been regulated through standards, SMEs complain that conformity assessment bodies need to issue a new certificate, even for the smallest uh, product modifications, uh, irrespectively from their impact on safety. So even if you change an aesthetic element of your product, uh, the conformity assessment body has, has the, the law says they have to issue a new certificate and there is no discount for that. So this is the second problem, which needs to be addressed in our opinion. The third issue, which is probably fundamental, but also a bit strategic for Europe is um, a bit ideological. And what are the consequences of using standards to regulate a technology which essentially is not even mature enough, okay? So uh, the consequence for me is that uh, it is hard to imagine that any SME or even slightly larger companies, to be honest with you, will want to invest in participating in standards making for products that do not even exist yet, okay? We know by experience that SMEs hardly participate when their own current products are at stake. So in other words, uh, by delegating standards make, uh, make, making uh, to set uh, uh, the rules for future products, we are essentially offering the keys of new markets to big tech, okay? So the strategic question is how the commission is going to make sure that the standards are not set by dominant companies and used by those to become even more dominant in the future. So in conclusion, uh, to sum up, uh, I'm not against the choice of the commission to use standardization to regulate AI, but there are some very concrete and substantial issues to be, to be addressed. Uh, and we have to be clear that the role of the EU institutions, the commission in particular, is not over by just publishing this regulation and essentially delegating the, word, the work to standardization bodies. 
So we have three requests to be concrete based on what they said. First, we want the institutions to install rules and safeguards to make sure that there is a real and effective representation of SMEs in standardization bodies. This needs to be done. Second, uh, we want the EU to ensure that the conformity assessment will be done in a way that is not excessive, there is not an excessive burden, and there is not a too high cost for the SME innovators. Third and last, we would like the EU to ensure that the choice of AI standards and their own drafting of such standards will be in the hands of European companies, including SMEs, not offering a chance to those who are already dominant on the market to become even more dominant and thus spoil any residual hope of uh, digital sovereignty in Europe. Uh, thank you very much, Salvatore, thank and happy you. to continue the discussion. Thanks a lot, Sebastiano. Very, very clear and strong messages, uh, which I'm sure also will come back later on. Uh, now, uh, I mean, the difficult challenge now for Letizia, of course, after all these interventions, having heard all these different points of view, I let's say would probably ask uh, how can the different expectations from uh, the different stakeholders as we have seen uh, find the common ground when coming to standardization and also as it seems clear from what for example both uh, Sebastian, Lindsay, Carlos uh, but also other panelists have indicated it seems that also priority standards or areas will have to be selected if we want to have a pragmatic approach. What do you think are the priority areas for standardization from the view of the operators? Thanks. Thank you, Salvatore, for those two questions and for having me today. I also want to thank the Slovenian presidency and the European Commission for organizing this event. I think it's very timely after the AI, um, I did the presentation of the AI Act. So, I just wanted to set up a little bit of context, you know, standard, um, I think in, 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 in many organizations means quite a lot of work, long running, um, you know, and, and, and it's been, the sharing and the collaboration has been quite uh, difficult for some organization, even some of the big tech or some of the big uh, corporation out there. And I think we're in a different world now, which is the post pandemic world where we have macro dynamics and priority that are really driving the collaboration and the innovation agenda. You know, things like climate change, green energy, sustainability are really kind of encouraging this, the, the scaling of standardization because individual player can't really possibly solve some of those major challenges which is set which is set for all big organizations as well as as the small one and which is a key priority for the eu around the green energy and digital transition so i think we're in a new dynamics you know uh, dynamic world in terms of your question around you know which organization is 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 that said to kind of, uh, you know, bring that consensus together, I think is really key that we, uh, you know, rely on well-established standard organization already. And, and we've heard from uh, Lindsay or from Carlos that we need to go faster. Uh, we need to prioritize, uh, and but we need to really rely on that experience uh, that has been built across uh, across time. So organizations like Etsy or Oasis, uh, of which I'm part of the board of, we just created a European foundation. It's a global standard. We actually, you know, to accelerate uh, the creation of standard, we uh, we're not starting from scratch. We're collecting. You know, there's a number of organizations, and AC may have been one around. You know, transparency of AI, you know, Accenture, we did a lot of work on, you know, modeling human and machine uh, collaboration using conversational AI is really also harvesting some of, some of that work that has been done outside of some of the traditional remit to accelerate uh, accelerate the creation of standard. So we're launching uh, in the next few days, actually, with, with Oasis, uh, a, a new standard called Recite, which is around conversational AI modeling, which is, you know, with, with a number of parties. And, and obviously, it will be open for, for, for people to come and, and take part. So I think for me, prioritization, not starting from scratch, leveraging the experience of standard bodies is absolutely essential uh, as, as as we go on and you know be inclusive it's super important i think it's you know everybody needs to be represented out there we need 
European initiative that are aligned to, you know, international agenda, definitely, because we don't want to segregate the market. So, you know, finding that balance is going to be really key as we go forward, um, you know, into, into some of that. Regarding the standards that are, that are required, there's a number of, you know, horizontal standards, I call them, uh, or foundational standards that are, that are needed. And we talked about a few already around robustness, accuracy, transparency, explainability, human oversight, those are things that have been sold in pocket uh, by a number of people that needs to be leveraged and expanded to the need of, of most. Yeah? Uh, but there's also a need, you know, going back to the micro level agenda for sharing, you know, inside data products and, and all of that. And I think the, it's very linked to the data agenda out there. And this is the only way, you know, actors uh, will be able to really share, innovate and create really this next this next next generation world and, uh, and, and, and those new models that are responding to, you know, the individual agenda of company, but some of the broader agenda uh, of society in, in general, yeah. Uh, meaning we can think about a few, uh, you know, we've been part of, uh, of the Skywise project uh, as, as Accenture, which was a huge consortia of a number of um, of company it was driven by uh, Airbus, uh, but sharing you know Airbus data with airline with you know all the supply chains is really kind of a they started to create a standard on how to exchange you know all the way up through the industry and create new ways of you know being greener or uh, optimize uh, some some of the new model and be more innovative and I think we need a, a, a lot more of that as well in key area like health energy because in a renewable energy is, is really important and manufacturing is in huge transformation i think those those verticals are super important and we see definitely a huge trend in in that space thank you very much letizia and this closes the first uh, uh, round of interventions uh, uh, which i think gave us and provided us with many many inputs so we will try now to uh, engage further with our speakers. Uh, I was told that, that there are many, many questions coming, so we will do our best. What I ask the speakers here is really to come back with a short flash. I will try to cover all the speakers in an equal manner, so I'll do my best. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and sorry if some questions may not be addressed due to the lack of time, because we have more or less 15 minutes or, or so left. Uh, I think that one of the questions that seem also uh, to, 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 to attract the attention of many is about the international character of standardization. So I think uh, this point was also indicated by Lindsay and by Lara already. So now I would turn probably to Sebastian for a quick flash. Uh, how do you see, let's say, uh, the, the possibility for the EU to set global standards uh, and how important uh, uh, is international standardization in general? So a, a flash. So I'm really grateful to all of you to be very, very brief. <laughs> um, yes, uh, it's an important issue. Uh, I'd like to distinguish between standards that are purely technical and standards that in some shape or form underpin regulation. It's clear that it's preferable for several reasons for standards to be international. It's the preference of any company that uh, operates on the global level because it makes life a lot easier. Um, and it's also preferable because it brings together the maximum uh, number of experts on any given topic. Having said that, um, any standard that is Europe specific, um, for example, because it responds to a specific European concern, uh, will have a uh, certain view about uh, fundamental rights in Europe that is not shared elsewhere in the world, and therefore any AI standards that are related to, to uh, fundamental rights need to be developed at the European level. Similarly, anything that is um, directly underpinning EU regulation, anything to do, for example, with how conformity assessment works is Europe specific and needs to be developed in Europe. So th there, is, there is a very clear um, uh, kind of division of labor, if you like. Um, there is also a established framework within the standardization organizations to avoid duplicate work and also to uh, have uh, kind of commenting uh, options. It touches, of course, on the, on the issue of uh, European digital sovereignty that, that's been mentioned both by Sebastiano and by uh, Lara. And uh, here we have uh, great gaps in conceptual understanding. We've identified the problem, 
but no one really knows how to deal with the issue of competing or, or overlapping jurisdictions, neither in regulation nor in standardization. And uh, I've, I've actually been involved in kicking off an activity on the standardization side, a um, CENTENLEC, uh, IEEE, CWA on digital sovereignty to try and come up with an initial conceptual framework on how to handle, as we call it, regional digital sovereignty, a way for different regions of the world to go slightly different ways without erecting um, barriers in, in the sense of a, of, a, of a great firewall, because that's not, not really what we want. Um, so yes, that, that's just as a, as a quick flash, I'll stop there. No, thanks. I know it's not easy, but yeah, it's the way to reply to as many questions as possible, but thanks, Sebastian. I will really ask for everyone for being really, for giving a flash. So Sebastian, I, I saw you raised your hand. So probably if you'd give a flash, a very, very brief yeah. flash on this point, and then we move forward. Very quick, because I want to make a, a connection because the question is about internet, the international dimension. I would like to make a connection with the transatlantic trade council discussion. You know that the Biden administration is really keen to get uh, an agreement with the EU on, 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 certain, on certain concepts uh, uh, on trade, especially regarding the digital, the digital sector. And here I think we have a great opportunity as Europe to try and agree with the US on uh, the ethical principles of artificial intelligence. Because if we do so, it's, it is very ambitious. Because I agree, there are substantial differences, as Sebastian mentioned. But if we could agree with the, our US partners on that, uh, then really we will offer our own companies a great opportunity because we will have really expand the borders of our of, of, our, of our markets. And we will therefore, of course, need to set standards in agreement with our US counterparts, uh, such that, uh, you know, we will create a, really a, a strong uh, uh, pole of, uh, you know, ethical, ethical uh, um, um, ally alignment uh, uh, regarding, regarding AI. So, you know, it's a great Thank opportunity, you. in my opinion. Thanks also, Sebastian. It's a very good point also because you anticipated one of the questions. So we can uh, tick the box of another question which was raised. I saw about the EU, EU US trade and technology <coughs> council as an opportunity. And now probably I move to Carlos. Uh, I see that there is an interesting question about the context specific nature of AI. So given the, how context specific AI can be, uh, what can be really standardized? Uh, so I think that is an interesting question from the GRC perspective that was, of course, uh, uh, in line with the, line, with, the, with the overall perspective of the regulation, a kind of uh, attention on the horizontal aspects of AI. But I think this question deserves a flesh. A very... Well, this is indeed a, a, a very good question huh? because uh, here we have, a, a, I would say, two uh, sometimes contradictory elements. One is the general purpose nature of AI. So. AI is a, type of, a set of technologies that can be used in a varied a set of uh, scenarios, but AI is pretty much context-driven. So the way an AI system will behave is uh, pretty much linked to the context in which this system will uh, operate. Uh, I think the approach uh, uh, taken by the commission is the right one, which is uh, an approach in which we base and try to regulate the horizontal aspects of uh, artificial intelligence. And I think that uh, the link, uh, between the regulation and the standards should be the same. So, uh, and this is why we have also tried to analyze the landscape uh, of AI standards, trying to identify the gap and to uh, identify what are the areas in which these efforts are uh, most uh, needed. So I would say that as uh, AI is a general purpose technology that is to be used in a particular context, the approach to maximize the efforts on standardization will, will, will be to find those areas which are horizontal and can be uh, uh, standardized with less impact of the context. That's, that's the idea. And the work we have uh, been doing is, in a sense, try, trying to identify what are those gaps uh, that uh, would allow us to maximize the effort on standardization. So technical documentation. Technical documentation is something that can be standardized with regardless of the context, if, 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 if I understand my, uh, if, if I explain myself, why? Yeah. Because the way you document the system does not depend on where the system is going to be uh, used. A risk management system 
is also something that might be context free. Why? Because it's about how you handle the risks that appear, not about the particular risk that will emerge. That's a bit the idea. This is why we have approached uh, our analysis trying to identify those gaps that could al allow us to have a standardization which is a bit context free. Thank you, Carlos. Thanks a lot. And uh, I think there is a, another interesting question about the particular nature of AI address once again to Lindsay. Uh, what very good so far, so because I would like at least another round. So please continue to be brief because I have to go for the conclusions at 1547, 48 <laughs> in our schedule. So Lindsay, there is a focus from one of our, uh, from the audience about the users. Users are important in, uh, in the context of AI. Can we, are we in a position also to write standards concerning users? You know also that there are some obligations for users in the regulation, but just a quick flash on this consideration. I think the AI Act has uh, clearly said that if there is significant uh, impact on the user, they should at least know that the AI system is uh, involved you know, under the hood. So uh, that's pretty easy to, to, reg to regulate, to standardize and to, to test. You know, is there, a, is there a, maybe there will be an international symbol saying that you know, this, this news or this um, image that we're looking at uh, is coming from an AI and is not, uh, let's say, live. So uh, maybe next time I'll be represented by an AI system and you'll see a little triangle. But uh, that part's easy. But the difficult part is, well, uh, the user's going to say, what the hell? Um, I don't care. And then uh, it'll come down to cases where maybe a medical decision is wrong because um, you know, the user wasn't giving serious answers and uh, a human might have spotted it, but an AI system just took it all in and said, yeah, sure. And this is where you know the user interaction with the AI system may change the whole, let me call it game, because uh, it, it's not just uh, neutral how the user interacts with the system. So I, I think that will, the, the obvious things will be easy, but the, the subtle changes because AI is in the game, in the loop, is going to be uh, much harder to track down. Thank you. Thank you very much for being also brief. Uh, I think that there is a lot of focus, so then uh, that's why I would go back to Lara for that. Uh, there is a lot of focus also from the audience on one point that you made and uh, some others have made. So how do we ensure a person from the audience says, how, will, how can we find the balance between the prompt creation of standards and involving the voices of stakeholders? Because we know that, of course, there is a, a balance to reach there, right? So especially given timing constraints. Uh, just a thought, a flash on that, as you also indicated this element yeah i think i think it's it's a it's a good question i think uh, overall i mean i, I wouldn't really uh, as we all said the the, the inclusive approach to uh, the standardization process i i wouldn't uh, limit that and i think uh, you know we, we cannot force uh, also the, the the timing it takes to come to these standards so i wouldn't uh, you know put put any um, any any restrictions on, on that i think it is worth when looking at the ai act if some of the uh, implementation deadlines vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis then the, the standardization timelines, if that would be um, right, I mean I, I cannot really say specific uh, at this moment because we're still we're still analyzing what what is feasible. But I, I think that I wouldn't um, limit you know the, the stakeholder participation and the inclusive approach. The, as we were saying, you know, the, the technical expertise and discussions required, I, I wouldn't try to restrict that just in order to fit it into a specific time frame. So, um, yeah, that's just my short uh, kind of initial reaction to your question. Very clear message. So I think it's better to choose priorities for standardization, but not to necessarily restrict the participation of stakeholders. That's very clear. And now we move to uh, Letizia, so hopefully covering all our speakers. Uh, I think you mentioned that horizontal areas before that should be covered by AI, so certain specific areas. But one of the questions is quite interesting uh, uh, because it takes, let's say, the, the, the other side of the coin. Uh, do you think there are areas that cannot be standardized in AI? Yeah. 
That's an interesting. Uh, that's, an interesting. Uh, that's an interesting. I think it would take us forever to stand. You know, ultimately, when we talk about AI, we're modelizing the world and we're replacing. You know, we move from a, uh, the old ways of doing things was very deterministic with coding and system and all of that, and now we're moving to a more probabilistic. You know, learning from experience with AI system. So I think our quest to modelize the world is actually at least 40 years away, which is where the horizon of uh, gener uh, general AI is. So I think, you know, we will continuously be on a quest to standardize and modelize and, and you know, have computers supporting humans to do the next level and, and mimicking some of our things. So yes, there will be plenty of things that, you know, can't be modelized by AI. You know, I think in decision making for some particular topic, you know, obviously, you know, AI system very often have human supervision and, you know, with the best standards in the world, you can't, you know, when some of the things that AI is not great at is uh, sudden change. Yeah, we've seen it during the pandemic when there's too much sudden change, you have to actually do fundamental reshaping of your AI models and your training data and all of that because it's, it's not linear history anymore and you, so there are things that will need some punctual interventions, you know, because they just can't be modelized at this particular point in time yet. Yeah. Um, so uh, just to give you a few testers of, uh, of, of what will be very hard. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Letizia. It was quite a challenging question. So <laughs> I agree, it's not an interesting but challenging question. Uh, I have uh, in the bad, uh, unfortunately, position to have to come towards the conclusions because I think uh, we have to close at 1550. Uh, of course, uh, I also say under the control of the technical colleagues that we will try to follow up on the many questions received and with the help of also the panelists, it's something that we would be keen to engage with. So we will see also by publishing relevant information following this meeting, because I think that there were so many questions, so much interest around the topic that uh, definitely all questions deserve a reaction. In terms of conclusion, I will have to summarize in one minute, which is, of course, we will try to make it more extensively. But in one minute, I can say fundamentally that there is a, a, an overall broad consensus about harmonized standards being an opportunity for a good implementation of the AI Act. So I, I didn't see at least any major reaction against the use of harmonized standards for the implementation of the regulation. We have seen also, and in particular also, the work done by JRC, by also by Stand ACT, that we don't start from scratch at least, so there was already some work done in the context of AI, so there is already some basis to build upon, but of course there is significant effort which remains to be done. And I think many of the challenges have been mentioned in this discussion, the technical expertise and the research needs around AI. I think the area of testing is one which uh, has been mentioned in many meetings. I think JRC and Carlos have al has also emphasized that as an area for particular attention. The proper stakeholder engagement uh, at all levels, which is an absolute priority, notably given the consensus-based nature of standardization. And, uh, the big elephant in the room, clearly the timing of the overall exercise, which is certainly challenging. But, uh, and I take one message, I think also from Lara, it is preferable that based with the co whole community, we take priorities for standards, but we don't reduce the participation and the discussions uh, uh, towards achieving consensus. So better to prioritize, but not to limit the participation. In a nutshell, I think these were the conclusions. Thank you very much to all of you for being there. And uh, I think it was uh, an exciting and informational panel, uh, and we will follow up with more information. Thanks to the speakers for their participation. Thanks a lot, really. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thank you.